Here. Let's start the uh, final talk of the uh, morning session. Uh, yeah, next one, please. Okay. I'm going to start because I realize I spent two hours talking about classical quantum chemistry rather than quantum computing quantum chemistry. So we're going to start talking about that now. Someone asked me a very good question in the break where they were like, where, where do the qubits come into the configuration interaction? So basically, in the, in the, the qubits can like represent occupation numbers. By, if, you look at this, if you look at these configurations here, this would be, you'd have, so this would be a 12 qubit problem, and you'd have a qubit in, the first six qubits would be zero, one, 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 and then the, the final six qubits would be in zero, zero, zero. So you can see all the possible combinations of ones and zeros which come from the t to the n possible qubit configuration. Um, you get from, you, you, you can, you, the qubits can represent all the configurations this way. So it's actually interesting because the configuration interaction only stays within six particles, but the qubits can obviously have all zeros as well. So the configuration scales less severely for a given particle number than the whole qubit space. Okay. And then the, the matrix elements of this, of this operator are just the typical second quantized ones that you've seen before. Like this guy. Okay. So let's start talking about some quantum computing stuff. So, well, so we can typically, the, 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 because the matrix scales it combinatorially, we have to truncate it for real problems. And if you notice, we can form, we can actually form our basis using the second quantized representation. So if you see, you can form, if we, we can form the excitations by starting from the Hartree Fox state, which is the 111000 state. We can then form an excited thing on that by destroying one of the virtuals and creating one of the excited orbitals with a CAI, where A is the, is the occupied and I is the virtual. So this, this is called this, this is an excitation operator. So we're generating the basis here. Um, and we call these, these T's the excitation operators here. So we've got our single as excitation and our double as excitation. Okay, so you can, uh, this truncation means that uh, uh, you, might, you might hear it's called SI, CISD, singles and doubles. This is precisely because that we wanted to have all possible excitations that would be a gigantic matrix we can't fit on our computer. So we truncate it to the singles and doubles level to make it manageable. Now, this is where, and then a couple cluster, we'll briefly very talk, talk about it very briefly. Basically, it takes this linear operator and exponentiates it. And by doing that, you get basically more of the wave function back for, for the same cost, because you get the cross terms from the excitations coming from the expansion, the exponential expansion of the operator. So basically, a couple of customers give you more bang for your buck when compared to the same T, 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 T operator. Now, this, a couple of clusters motivated the first quantum chemistry, quantum ansatz for quantum computing. And this is a unitary couple cluster. And basically, you take this T, it's non unitary, and then you basically exponentiate the T minus this complex, complex conjugate. And, it, and this is now a unitary couple cluster object. And, but the problem is, when you try and solve this with classical quantum, quantum chemistry method, this is non terminating. But you do a nice trick in quantum chemistry. So yeah, so and here's the here's what, here's what the things look like. So we have T. So Ti is the it's called the cluster cluster expansion coefficient. And then the the unitary form is just this. Now, in quantum, to get to work on a quantum computer, we do this trick called trotterization which basically takes the exponentiated uni unitary operator and then we expand it to some degree, degree rho. Typically, rho one is fine, so we just take the first order trotter. And then we get this, basically. So basically, what this is doing is you break up each, each excitation 
in the expansion into its own exponential shaded unit tree operator, and then you apply them in in series as a, as a rigid product. Now th this has a this has a form that can be implemented directly on a quantum computer. So sine naught, remember, is a Hartree Fock wave function. This is the initialization state, if you want, reference state. This is the one 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 zero 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 etc. In the lowest occupied state, we then act on that with our Dutri operator. These products of, of exponentials, and then we have our Dutri couple cluster and that. Now, how do we get this onto a quantum computer? Oh. Yeah, the, and the, one thing: the ordering can be important here. Um, and it can give a better answer. that. So there was some work by Gonat Chan showing that you can actually get the exact wave function if you get the ordering correct. Um, all right, so how do we get this onto a computer? Here's a nice iron trap. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not biased, but they are the best. Um, so we what we have to do is the, the, these TIJ, these TNs, these are our fermionic creation annihilation operators. Now, you may have heard of something called the jordan Wigner transform. We need to map these fermionic creation annihilation operators to our, um, to, to, uh, to the power loop the operators, which can then be implemented directly on a quantum computer. So, you might have seen this before. So this is, this is the jordan Wigner mapping. We have, an, we have a fermionic excitation operator and then this is essentially, we have a product of, so the product of Z, of Z, the Zs keep track of the antisymmetry. So if you've got a, so if you're in, if you're acting on orbital four, we go, we have Z acting on zero, one, two, three. And then the, the actual flip operation is done by this X minus Y here. And then that is equivalent to Creation annihilation operators in space. And this is the same for the, so this is the creation minus x minus y, annihilation x plus y, x plus iy, sorry. So applying this to our excitation operators, we get some quite, quite gnarly things. So this is, but you can see here, we basically you can see the. The, the, you can see where the x minus y's and x plus y's come in. Sorry. Because we have two, two creation annihilation operators. Um, but ba basically, you, you have the z strings, then you have like this qu the quadratic pair, and then you have the z, for the, for the doubles, you have the z strings. And then you have these quartic set of eights. So you get eight. So for, from so here you got two, so the Jordan being transformed for the fermionic excitations here. You get from two sets of fermionic crystallization operators, and then you end up with eight for the doubles, and then two, um, and then two here. So the doubles scale much worse in this picture. And there's lots of ways you can generate these things. So um, it's open fermion on Kiskit. We have in Quanto. But the, so we have to exponentiate these. Now we have these, we've done the Jordan Wigner transform. We have to exponentiate these power loops. So there's a really famous way to do this, which is if we take one thing away from this lecture, this should be it. Because the power loop gadget is the most powerful primitive in quantum computing, in my opinion. It shows up everywhere, so once you spot it, it's really easy to make algorithms with. So we've got our, we've got this exponential set of Pauli's from our from our fermionic Jordan Wigner transform. We then that it's may not, it might not be that obvious to you, but this is a, a multi control. This is a multi qubit RZ rotation. So you can I, I encourage you to in, in the break. Maybe turn this into a Z, so with no rotation, and then come in with a one, 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 one state, 
and then work through it, and you'll see that it works as a multi-qubit parity operation. If you then were to add a rotation in a Z basis here, you then get this really powerful e to the i theta over 2 z dead dead. dead. So now you've got an exponentiated, parameterized power rotation. Now this is really powerful for many things, which is Hamiltonian simulation, um, like these, these unifacable cluster ansatzes. And then we can change that now to n, so that was just a z dead, dead, dead. Now we can change that by just a basis rotation on each side of our C not ladder. And then we get any power gadget we want. So, so this is really powerful. So now you can get exponentiated um, power word. And then what the, what the coding exercise this afternoon is going to be basically building a Hamiltonian simulation from this structure. Okay, so, so this is really like, uh, it's very powerful because now you've got, you can have access to Hamiltonians and cluster operators exponentiated. Okay. Okay, so now, now let's talk about VQE. So VQE in quantum chemistry is probably, because it's actually sort of the quantum chemistry Hamiltonian has n to the four terms, it's the most, it's a fully interacting fermionic problem. It's probably not, VQE is probably not being very applicable to quantum chemistry in my opinion. Um, but it's still going to be useful for state preparation and things like that, so it's worth learning about. So VQE is essentially this. So you, you have the state preparation. The state preparation is this ansatz that I showed you before. This is your, this is your wave function. And you, you, want, you want to have some parameters so you can change your wave function. You then have your Hamilton, then you have to measure that Hamiltonian. And, and, you can, and you can do that via individual Pauli terms. I'll explain that in a second. Then you have to measure, yeah, so, so, you apply, so you apply the Hamiltonian, then you measure it. Okay, and then you repeat for each Hamiltonian term. Okay, so U can be anything. It can be unitary couple cluster, it can be hard efficient, it can be whatever ends actually want. It just depends on how expressible it's going to be, if you will get there to represent, how accurately you'll be able to represent the ground state. Um, but we're not, yeah, so far this isn't, isn't even a VQE. There's, there's no, this is just for one set of parameters, I want to measure a Hamiltonian for P. Okay, so we haven't changed it. VQE is the process of updating the parameters. This is just a single energy calculation. So here, so if we look at the first point, this is, this is quite, these are quite old slides, so I'm using Piscuit stuff. Um, but if you see here, this is the unit, you can see in the slide, so you can see these C0 C ladders, right? These are each of the excitation operators that we showed, these, these fermionic creation annihilation operators. So you've got this set of fermionic operators. You've got a set of exponentiated fermionic operators. Sorry, fer set of exponentiated Paulis, these Pauli gadgets. So you've got these chains of Pauli gadgets, and you've got a parameter at each one at the bottom of these C0 ladders. That's a unitary couple cluster around that. Um, so by changing these parameters here, 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 you can change the energy, basically. People like the unitary couple cluster around because it's got some physical rep representation. Because <coughs> you actually have, it's representing the excitations of the operator from, from the Hartree block state. So you can actually get a picture on what the orbitals are doing. Whereas if you're just using hardware efficient ansatz or some random M massive entanglement and rotations. It's very unphysical. Okay. Um, it's kind of like tensor network methods and CI in, class in the classical space. Whereas tensor network, you lose the kind of orbital information. It's just a mangled mess of nonlinear parameters. Um, okay. So then, so we've just prepared our state with our ansatz. We want to now take our operator. How do we measure our operator? In the, in, this is in, and this is in NISC setting. So you, t so you can apply the same Jordan being transform. Our states are prepared by fermionic, fermionic operators, exponentiators. But the operator is also containing these fermionic operators. 
So we have to Georgian Vigna that into something which we can apply on a quantum computer. So the, Hamilton, the, the weighting coefficients here, when you apply the Georgian Vigna transform, some program will probably spit this out for you, but you can, if you do it by hand, you end up with something like this. And the, 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 there's some mixing happens between the, these, but for, the, for, for H2, you end up with uh, 15 terms. And you have to measure, it, and, and then the weightings, the weightings are these parameters, weighting each power string, they're like related, they're not the same. Um, and then the, the Paulis are related to the Primonic operators. But that's, they're not the same, that's just showing what they correspond to. And it's, 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 it's similar to measuring the density matrix elements. Um, so you have, so basically now, in order to calculate the total energy of a system, you have to prepare your state, and you have to measure the red, which are these Pauli strings, which, which are applied to these key bits. And then you have to times it by its weight, the interaction coefficient. And that, and then you loop, loop over all the terms in the Hamiltonian. Uh, and in the, in the chemistry setting, these are the classically computed integrals, but these, if it's a Fermi hub one, these are just parameters. But what I'm trying to say, is that the, the only quantum part in this calculation is the Pauli's. The coefficient is just outside. This is, this is done, this is done put in post-processing. So how do we measure the, the, the density matrix elements? Um, well, they're kind of the, the Pauli version of the density matrix elements. So this is quite subtle. It's known as a technique of operator averaging. So you might be like in your quantum computing algorithm, click measure, calculate excitation value. But what's actually happening? So if you're measuring in, like, so if you have a Pauli ZZZ, for example, if you measure it in the Z axis, um, basically you have to, and you have three key bits. If you had zero, zero, 001, you have a parity of 1, zero, zero, 0000, you have a parity of 0, et cetera. Now the parity of these, of these basis axis measurements, which correspond to it, the pi z, pi x, pi y, um, from the previous equation, the parity of the shot measurement and the outcome corresponds to the eigenvalue uh, of the Pauli. Now, by measuring over many times, you'll get a mixture between one and uh, parities of one and zero in the out shot outcomes. That'll give me a mixture of eigenvalues between one and minus one. You average that over the number of shots, and then you times that by the co weighting coefficient, and that will give you the, the, the contribution to the energy of that Pauli term. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so this, is, this is quite a subtle thing. Uh, so, and then the, the VQE, so this, is from, this, is, this is figure is from the classic paper by uh, Romero and Ryan Barrush, Jad McLean. So what this is showing is it's like VQE basically, the Rayleigh variational principle saves you again. So you can basically just twist the parameters in your state preparation, and if it goes down, you're, you're saved because you have a convex optimization problem. Um, Basically, what this is showing is you, you prepare your state, you measure your state and get the energy from the method I just showed, and then you calculate the energy, and then you change the parameters just so that the energy will go down, basically. So you, you have a gradient optimizer, or whatever optimizer you use. But basically, you're changing the parameters such that the total energy of the system goes down. And the, the key point here is that you have this measurement of Pauli's at each, at each step, and you're summing over each turn in, in the Hamiltonian. Um, so yeah, you, and you just change the parameters in your ANZATS until your energy gets to a minimum. But obviously, because your ANZATS is, there's a, there's a large amount of choice in the ANZATS, right? So your ANZATS might not be good enough to get to, one ANZATS might be able to get to, for the same operator, one and that might be able to get to low energy and another and that. Or on the other case, you might have this barren plateau problem or local minima. One and that might get stuck in a local minima 
from a different initial set of parameters, which is bad. So the reason why I say that, like I, and this is, in my opinion, is, I don't want to say it's not going to work or be useful, but like for calculating energy is certainly not the right, exact right use case for it because the, the amount of measurements you need. We know, we know quantum computers have, we have a finite budget of measurement cost. These variational algorithms require a huge amount of measurements. Like you're looping of every term in the Hamiltonian, and then you're changing the parameters each time. So if you, there's lots of reviews now with the same VQE, it will take like hundreds of years to do like anything useful for chemistry. So that brings me to quantum Krylov methods, which I think are a useful application of quantum computing for NISC stuff. So we go back to exact diagonalization, where we're building, remember we have this, we have this huge basis. That, yeah, I'm going to speak now about quantum Krylov method, which is probably, I would say is the, the nearest term application of uh, NISC for chemistry, I would say. Um, and it kind of le it leverages the classical quantum balance in a slightly different way, which I'll explain. Rather than with VQE, where you're leveraging the classical co cost on the gradient optimizer and the constant cost on the shot measurement and the, the sort of energy measurement to the operator averaging, here you do something slightly different, which I'll explain. So, going back to that exact diagonalization or configuration interaction in chemist speak, we have this exponentially scaling basis. This matrix obviously scales exponentially. This is, it, well, it's combinatorial, but it's within 2 to the n. Well, yeah. I'll explain that again. If anyone wants to explain that, go ahead. So, so, yeah, so we have this exponentially scaling matrix. This is bad. Okay. So, what quantum Krylov methods, so what Krylov methods do is it's a very general prof method, it's really cool. So you again start with the Tarchi Fox method, but then rather than expanding your basis by our excitations, you expand your basis by our powers of functions of the Hamiltonian, a number of k times. So if you see, and typically the dimension of k is much smaller than the dimension of the, the previous matrix. So you're, you're scared, these are typically in order of 100, maybe less. Like, um, Whereas, like before, you're exponenting, uh, you're scaling exponentially, and the basis obviously scales just like this. So you have your wave function is now a linear combination of your uh, your reference state plus your first state, which is the first power of the Hamiltonian function, etc. Okay, and then you still have this generalized eigenvalue problem, but it's much smaller. Okay. Now, obviously, the complexity is being hidden inside these function of h, okay? But we'll talk about that now, right in a second. So, um, and then if you think about the, the Krylov generalized eigenvalue problem, the matrix elements are these things. So hij is now, you have this reference, bracket reference, and then you have the function of, I, function of h of i going to the left, function of h of j going to the right, and then you end up with this matrix problem. So the ij matrix elements are formed by, the ij basis functions are formed by f to the h to the i and f to the h to the j. And the overlap matrix elements are formed in exactly the same way, whereas now there's no h, so we just have this function of h to the i, and function of h to the j. So clearly, this is difficult. It, these, so even though the, the basis is smaller, the, the eigenvalue problem we need to solve is smaller, these elements are much more complex. So we can't just solve these by operator averaging, however, like these functions require a bit more thought on how to implement them. So there's a number of different ways to do them. Those are kind of the three famous ones. Um, so you have real-time evolution. So this is the function of h to the j that you apply is the time evolution operator. So powers of the time evolution operator are just n times t in time. Okay? So you've got j type, sorry, j, 
f to the h to the j, you know, as a power of the time evolution operator, it's just e to the i h t j t. Okay. Right. And the reason uh, time evolution seems, seems to be very popular because it's there's there's many proposals to do time evolution efficiently on quantum computers. The, I'll, I'll, I'll be in a more fault tolerant setting, but you can see that there are ways to do time evolution quite cheaply if you just have small t and low j. Um, it's obviously more expensive than VQE, but it's definitely cheaper than phase estimation. So it's, I, I, yeah. And then if anyone's confused about the, the, what the, the function of a matrix is, the function of a matrix is defined as the singular value decomposition where the function acts on the singular value. So if you think about it, if SVD is just a rotation, a scaling and a rotation, so you can just scale, you can just act on the scaling part and then the rotation will fly on each side. And another famous one, another famous function of H and Creel method is imagining time evolution, which is, which is uh, kind of, so you're just basically missing the I here. So this, this will propagate all the, all, the, uh, all the states, and you'll get this linear combination of basis states in the original space, in the eigenvector vector space of this. And then imagine time evolution if you're not familiar with it. Um, so I, I've done a lot of work in, this, in the, both these areas. But imagine time evolution is essentially, it's a, it's a way to propagate um, to the ground state. It's a kind of, it's a quantum way of doing optimization. So if you propagate an imagine time evolution far enough, you'll only end up with the ground state. That's a non-unitary evolution, because if you think about your initial state being a linear combination of all possible eigenvalue, eigenvectors, the ground state is just one eigenvector. So you're killing all the other eigenvectors apart from one. So it's not a rotation, like a unitary rotation, it's a projection. So this, this, is, this is difficult to implement on a quantum computer, but you can do it, and I put a paper out yesterday on it. Yeah. Um, And then finally, this is kind of the very sexy topic at the moment in quantum computing is the Chebyshev polynomials. And these, these are kind of, the way I think about them are, you know, the double angle formula that you learn about at A level or whatever high school diploma you did. And then if you recursively do that to n to the power n times, you get the Chebyshev polynomials, basically. And these, these have recently been shown, can be implemented by Grober's reflections recursively, iteratively. So I know Callum showed, may have given you a tutorial on that. Um, and then finding these functions is a really open, implementing these functions on quantum computers is a really open research area. So this is really, this is quite a hot topic at the moment. Okay, so, then there's a, you can take this further, so make, make the whole thing unitary, you can even change the eigenvalue problem itself to be unitary. So you can take real-time evolution and then take the Hamiltonian operator and make that itself a unitary rather than it being a Hamiltonian operator. So you're now solving a unitary generalized eigenvalue problem rather than the, the original one. And the eigenvalue is related so that the, the phi ends here are the solutions of, so the, the lambda ends are related to the, the solutions of e to the i h t. By this, and then the uh, then are related to the eigenvalues of the original Hamiltonian by this equation. So what you can do is you, you, you treat your so we're, we're working in the time evolution space. Time, we're using time evolution as a function, a creed of function. But then we also do the operator as a creed of as the so, so we replace what was the H. Oh. So what was before, what was before was this H. We've now replaced that with e to the. Oh, sorry. Uh, we, we now replace that with e to the i H T. So what you can do, which is really cool, is because these are all exponential, you can just add together all the powers. 
So you end up with this much smaller and simpler object here. Right? So this is, this is really powerful here. And you, you just reduce the complexity of your problem massively. Because if you think about it, you only have to calculate like the, the overlap and the Hamiltonian mixed determinants can be calculated from the same set of objects, right? So you, so you, you end up like reducing the, you get to, I think you go from a quadratic to a linear scaling problem this way. So this is really cool. And then this can be implemented, these are, uh, yeah, so this, this is what I'm trying to say here. So the overlap and the, Hamilt or no, the unitary Hamiltonian, whatever you want to call it, elements are from the same set. And there's a, there's, they're generated from this smaller set here of K. And these are just transition matrix elements, right? So this is your reference state acting on the time of and turning it into another state and then taking the overlap. Now these can be implemented very easily on quantum computers and cheaply-ish, if you think medium term cheaply, uh, with the Hadamard test, where the Hadamard test we're taking that time evolution operator, controlling it, and then doing the Hadamard test with that. And then doing that for different values of k, you can generate this object. So we need, you met, this is a complex value here. So we need, this is a complex value. So we need the real and imaginary parts of this. So that, that's quite easy to do. So you, you basically, to get the real and imaginary parts of the Hadamard test expectation, you do basically Hadamard test, but then you have an S here. Now, you can generate the, uh, the energy of the, this is calculated from E0 minus E1 here. So you basically add, calculate a difference. Um, so like, th this object is quite straightforward to calculate. So you can, the, there's a nice, I, I can show you the proof of this, but showing that this is an expectation value is quite straightforward. You just, you just have to combine the shots in the correct way. You have to do some post-processing on the shots, but it's straightforward. I think it's E1 minus E2, right? and shots. Don't correct me. Okay, so, so now you can see, so what, what I mean by this is leveraging the, the quantum classical balance in a different way, is that the quantum balance is now thrown into you have to take these Hadamard, this small set of Hadamard tests, where you have to do this controlled time evolution operator. So there's a lot of complexity hidden inside this box. So the, like trotterization is the simplest way. I will speak about that later in the in the fourth lecture. But there's a whole field like looking at different ways to improve time evolution operators. So time evolution is really a subroutine for many algorithms. So learning how to do time evolution is crucial, I think, if you want to work in quantum computing. Okay. Yeah, and so the balance, so the, the classical balance is really this matrix problem that you're offloading everything to, but that's quite small now, and the quantum balance lies more heavily than BQE, but in these, these time evolution, controlled time evolution operators. So I've also got a paper implementing this as well, if people are interested. <laughs> called very, it's under the name of variational phase estimation with variational fast forwarding where we basically try to do some approximate compilation of these objects to solve the same problem. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes to talk about phase estimation. That is not enough time, but whatever. Uh, okay, so we have, okay, so, so now we're moving on from the kind of hybrid methods where there's a balance between the classical part and the quantum part. We're now moving into the fully quantum algorithm. And the famous one of these is called quantum phase estimation. Okay, so many of you may have read this. Nielsen Chuang is really good. And we can, we can use this in quantum chemistry to a great advantage. So what is quantum phase estimation? So whenever we have a unitary acting on an eigenstate of that unitary, the phase will be generated into, uh, 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 the phase will be generated uh, from from the operation, so we get, and it's the eigenphase we call it. Now we can apply that to 
And it, like, we can use that property in quantum chemistry. So that uh, should be a minus two. Sorry. We can then use this phase idea. So if, if we have an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and we apply e to the i h t to it, we then get this object, which is like a phase, but the phase contains e j times t. OK, so the idea of phase estimation is essentially, can we exploit this and get and get this out, basically. So can we implement this and get this e, e to the i out? And again, this is going back to what I said before in how phase estimation for quantum chemistry uses time evolution as its main primitive. So, so there's lots of there's a lot of papers in phase estimation that study the complexity of phase estimation for energy values, where you change the method of Hamiltonian simulation that you use. So you. A lot of the Google papers, they like to use cubization and Chebyshev polynomial frameworks and cauterization, et cetera. Um, LCU. Yeah, I will speak about all of these next session. Okay, so can we get the eigenweight? So, what's actually happening when we think about phase estimation? I, I like this. So, as a physics person, or well, quantum chemist, I should say, I like to think about physical problems rather than kind of a computer science approach to things. So, if you look at what the, if we, have, if we do have an eigenstate of the system, and we apply this transition matrix element, and you, and you measure, so this is to measure along the, so this, this is time along here, and this is the real and imaginary part, part. You get this perfect spiral where the phase just propagates you in time, like this. And it's quite nice. And then it's essentially the, the phase, the, the phase is related to basically the distance between these, these spirals, which is really cool. Now, if you have, don't have an eigenstate, and you have some linear combination of eigenstates, which is what we have in practice most of the time, because if, if we could form the ground state, then we'd solve the problem. So, and this, this is one of the things that has caused a lot of issues with phase estimation, whether it's useful or not for quantum chemistry. But you can see here, the mass, if we, if we have a linear combination of eigenstates, we then basically get weightings of the competing phases in here for the different eigenstates. And that results in kind of this messy spiral where you've got all these different phases coming out. Um, and you have the, the, the weightings of each eigenstate Ooh, is here. But this is, I, this is how I like to think about phase estimation. It's, it's a really nice physical way of, of doing it. Okay, so what so the, 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 the canonical form of phase estimation, the old school way that you'll see from Milton and Chuang, is basically you have to really understand the motivation for it, you have to understand the, the quantum Fourier expansion. So I'll do my best to explain this. So obviously, we know the, the Fourier expansion basically is, says that any function can be expressed as an infinite weighted sum of cosines and sines. And you can see this here. Well, obviously, in computers, we want we don't have an infinite matrix. We have a finite matrix, dimensional matrix and finite dimensional vectors. So we have to truncate this to some some realistic amount, and, and this is essentially what happens. So you get an approximation here. Now, this underpins most of modern signal processing, and there's lots of people that say that the fast Fourier transform is the most powerful algorithm we've ever seen in the past 100 years, etc. But that you can take this sine cosine sum. I'm going quite quick, but you take this sine cosine sum, and you can always form an exponential of that. And then basically, what that means is that your Fourier expansion can be represented as a sum of exponentials, where the exponentials have a specific power um, relation. Okay, so it's it's quite a so you can see, you take a vector y. Vector y can be formed by acting with these uh, omega n k's to the n. And these omega n k's are these complex exponentials where you have the index n and k up here divided by n. OK. And it, it does, it is basically magic that you can trust this, but it does work. Um, and then I think about it, I'm actually just thinking about these things in a matrix form. So. You can think about the quantum Fourier transform as this linear map or a basis transformation. So you're just 
basically rotating the input basis into this new basis where the first one doesn't, doesn't nothing happens to it. The second one is times by omega. Or the first element times by one. Second times n times by omega, omega squared, and etc. Then you get these powers going down here. So this one goes up to the power of one, the power of two, the power of three, etc. Okay. Now you can think about this. The way the way that I think about these problems is basically a matrix vector, matrix vector product, where this linear map is a unitary matrix. And we know that unitary is can be implemented on, on quantum computers. So, um, so yeah. So, so the, the, the game of the quantum Fourier transform is implement the discrete Fourier transform unitary on a quantum computer. Now, you can see if we take a simple three qubit example, so the classical discrete Fourier transform, that would, that would be an eight dimensional or eight dimensional discrete Fourier transform. You can see here the first line goes to, is the, the power of one to the x. Yes. And the second line is x to the power of two. What you see is here, when you get to x to the power of eight, you loop back round because you get. This, this, this is one of the things that you have this equation here. That you always loop back around in the Fourier transform. You end up with these, these one states. And this is a three qubit, I say this is a three qubit, we aim to implement this as a three qubit thing because we've got a two to the power of three, like by two to the power of three, unitary matrix. Okay, so. Now, to really understand the quantum Fourier transform, you have to understand binary notation and some of the, bi like the, how you can get the integer values from the binary values. This is something I struggled a lot with, so, because um, like, computer scientists are quite native with this kind of stuff, but I was certainly not. So, if you think about, in typical binary notation, we have the x here represents the value in the binary, and then, the k then you have the two to the k is the, well, k is the position, and then two to the k is the value of the bit. Okay, so you have, so this is position two, bit value four, position one, bit value two, position, uh, yeah, you, you see what I mean, uh, two, two, yeah. Oh. So we can then, basically, we can get the integer value by just summing our x's and our two to the k's. So this is six, so it's four times one, two times one, one times zero. Okay. Now, quantum Fourier transform uses fixed point binary fraction notation. So this is the same idea, but we shift the decimal point and we do it with fractions. So here, it's a bit confusing, but we now use the, the position is one, two, three, four, to the right of the decimal point. And then we do, rather than times in by powers of two, times by powers of minus two. Sorry, two, minus powers, two to the minus powers for the position. So you can see here, this, this is, the bit value is one half, a quarter, one eighth, or sixteenth. And then we times it by it's, it's uh, bit value. So you can see one times a half is a half, one times a quarter is a quarter, plus one, and then one eighth times zero is zero, and one sixteenth times one is one sixteenth. And we add these together, and then this basically gives us our fraction, binary fraction, which represents our decimal. So the more bits you have, the higher resolution you get. And we represent it, whenever there's a square of brackets in my notes, this is a binary fraction. So just be really careful with that. And th this, is re this really did confuse me a lot. <laughs> so so maybe just, I'll leave this for a second because it's really, it's really central. This, the quantum Fourier transform. Okay, so uh, this is quite, quite heavy. So I'll try, 
you can just try and follow the derivation or just get the main idea. The main idea that you map between two states. But what the mapping is, is, is done by is, I, what the mapping is is given by this, these equations. So remember we had that, so we have a three cubic example. So we have this ij times k over n. Now this is n in the two, two cubic, in the three cubic case is two to the power of three. So these exponential powers that we had, we have here in the three cubic case, which is eight dimensional to n equals eight. I've changed the, I, I realize I've changed the indexing, so I apologize, but you can see it's basically rather over n here, instead of it's, but we put in a cubic form, so it's two to the power of three, okay? And then we've, we've normalized it with cubic form as well, so it's two to the power of three. Or sorry, I say cubic form, I mean just the powers of two. Okay. Now, this is a fraction, and we can we can explain we can explain that using the binary fractions that I just fixed point binary fractions that I showed before. Now, one eighth, two over eight, three over eight, etc. Then take this binary fraction form over this this KL, which is either one or zero, and then we can represent the, this this integer as a bit string. And you can see now we've got this sum over an exponential, sum of an exponential for each KL. So it's quite natural to break this exponential up into its constituent tensor product. That's what we do now. Okay, you can, you're, I'll send you these slides. Don't worry about trying to understand it. But the main idea is that you, you basically break up the tensor product you, break, you use the binary fraction notation to get sum of this weight of this coefficient. You then use that to break it into a tensor product for each bit. And then use this very powerful idea that, use that nice idea that when you have k to the zero, you have exponential of zero, which is always one. So then you get basically all, all the terms on the zero vanish and you just get these terms on the one. Uh, and, and this is a product state in, in uh, quantum information. So there's actually been a lot of work suggesting or proving that the quantum Fourier transform is not as, it's classically simulatable, which is well known, but it's, it doesn't generate strongly, strongly entangled states. Okay. Um, yeah, so. so you basically, so what, basically what, what you can do now is you can then, for all these binary fractions that you have, for the j's, you can basically take out the whole number and there will always be a dominant fraction. So you have a half, a quarter. The halves can be represented as the simplest binary fraction, fixed point binary fraction. The quarters can be represented as a four element term and the eight can represent it like this, et cetera. Um, I encourage you to work through this. Okay. So then you end up with this binary fraction kind of mapping. You get x to this e to the binary fraction. Oh, yeah. And you can, look, I'm rushing through this, but you can cut, when you expand the binary fraction, which is a sum into its exponential term, you can see where the, 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 where the quantum Fourier transform comes from because you have h. This, this this is just two. This is a h, and this is e to the power uh, two, and then three here, and you can kind of see it acting on each qubit this way. Um, again, I encourage you to work through this. So basically, the map, you basically can map from one state, it, uh, it, you basically map from the non-Fourier coefficients into the Fourier coefficient state. You've got your bit string state, and it goes to this Fourier basis state. And then the, the quite subtle step in the 
in the notion of Chuang is this kind of mapping from you get you map back from the integer bit you get from the you map back from the integer mapping to the to the bit mapping to the integer mapping, which is which is very this is very confusing. <laughs> okay, but basically, and the, the generalization is this, and you can see you can get you get more and more more and more higher resolution fractions. But the game of so the, the, the real like light bulb moment happens when if you think that if you, the way like if if you have an input state for a given phi in this form, because, the, because, the, because this is the Fourier basis, the quantum Fourier transform will map from that to the bit string. So you can read out the binary, fra the binary fraction of the phase from the input Fourier basis. The problem is getting the system into the Fourier basis to read out the phase. Now that's the game of quantum phase estimation, is how do we get the phase into the structure which can be read out by the quantum Fourier transform. So there's this, the, the, and that, that, that's what phase kickback is really, is really that, so you might have heard this property called phase kickback. So when we have an eigenstate, when we have an eigenstate, when we have a controlled unit tree acting on an eigenstate, you can see that the, the unit tree is applied just the one here. This is a controlled one U. But then, because this is the eigenstate, the phase just gets generated, and they can just form this product. So it's almost like this wasn't even touched. We just had the, the phase gets kicked back onto the antilla. So this is how we get the input state of the quantum Fourier transform in the way we want. This is the, the game we play to get the, the right input state of the quantum Fourier transform to read out the, the phase from the Fourier basis to the uh, from the Fourier basis to the phase basis. Okay, and then we can, as we noticed, there was powers of phases in the input state of the quantum inverse quantum Fourier transform. I should say, sorry. So we just did that by applying a powers of u to the n. So you can now see. Let's let's have a look at this example. So. You can see we apply the Hadamard to the first, first one, and then we apply these powers of um, controlled unit trees, and then we end up with these powers of controlled phases. And remember, this is an eigenstate here. Ooh. Now, now we basically we've got this eigen, we've got this Fourier basis here. We want to map out this Fourier basis to get this phase. So we read out the phase. From that, and then the phase can then be extracted via this binary fraction um, equation here. Okay, so, how do we, we then apply that to eigenvalues? So, the, the idea is the same. But rather than our, con our controlled unit now is our, contr is our controlled time evolution operator. And the phase that we're trying to calculate is Ej times t. Okay. And we're trying to extract this in the same way with the inverse quantum Fourier transform by, by a set of powers of controlled time evolution operators. This is again an example of where time evolution is so important and why cauterization and using these, these CNOTs, these tally gadgets, is really useful. So, again, we have this example. Uh, oh, yeah. And then we apply this excessive powers of this controlled time evolution. We then get this phase, sorry, there's a phase missing there, there's a T missing there. And then we can extract it this way. And it's, we can then, because the phase is e to the T. And then we can extract the energy from that. OK, so the problem with the canonical phase estimation is that it's very expensive. So you saw that you had these controlled time evolution operators. These time evolution operators themselves are really expensive things. And um, there's lots of work to try and reduce the cost of that. And the main one is that you need, so you don't need the eigen, like, the, obviously the, to define the algorithm, you need the eigenstate, but you must, but you don't need it as long as you have a significant overlap, I think it's over half. Because obviously successive, successive applications of the, the algorithm will then boost the, the signal of the 
correct phrase, which is, yeah. Um, yeah, so as I said, controlled time evolution is really important. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. And I'll explain this. And one of the other problems is obviously you need lots of ancillary. Oh, that's an ancillary. Um, and you probably, will, I mean, you almost definitely will need fault tolerant compilation and error correction for these algorithms to work. Okay. I'm going to stop there because I, I think we've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Any question? Uh, so, as you mentioned, and as it was mentioned the other day, uh, VQE doesn't work for, doesn't have any useful uh, appli applications for near term, like Nix error uh, computers, right? Like computers. So, what are the exact points where, like, Krilov methods, like, what, at which points do Krilov methods are like this? Uh, uh, quantum phase estimations, like uh, due to like space or time complexity, or like at which points are they more advantageous? And uh, for the near term, quantum Krilov methods are the best, I think. But uh, again, it's how you compile these functions as H. Um, I think the simplest trotterized time evolution operator combined with Krilov is a simple way to go. It's probably the best near term circuit primitive that will be the most useful. So controlled Hadamard test with, with trotterized time evolution operator. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, the, the second part, like, uh, like at, at which points does quantum phase estimation, like what, what, which of the parts does it show advantage or like, uh, it, like as you mentioned, QPE has practical applications, right? Yeah. Uh, like which part of the, uh, like the problem uh, encoding makes it so? Like what enables it so? I mean, there's lots of studies in complexity theory of like the precision needed for phase estimation and things. It's quite hard to compare them to Krilov methods because uh, they're, they're not the same. I would say if you have enough ancillas, phase estimation will win every time because you can get really precise energy values. But I think there'll be, a, I think Krilov methods are probably slightly better. I mean, but phase estimation is a long way off, I think. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was. Not, not answer, I so I, I had another question as well. So Garnet Chan works on tensor network uh, states for uh, like uh, for classical simulations, right, of uh, uh, quantum chemistry. So is there a quantum equivalent of uh, uh, like answers, like uh, uh, tensor network states answers, and do they work well, or is it? Yeah, great question. So there's two ways to approach this. The first one is that all quantum circuits are tensor networks. So you've got a tensor network and that if you've got a quantum circuit. Okay, so that's one way to play it. But there have, has been some work with my colleagues, Michael Fiskfog, uh, et cetera, Reza, people like that, where they're doing these quantum tensor networks, which is a slightly different approach where I'm sure you're aware, if you know about tensor networks and like matrix product states mirror, the bond dimension is a limiting factor because like, like, the, the, the basically the, the dimension of the matrix multiplication between the tensors needs to be truncated to a point that it, it's, like, it will fit on a classical computer. That sometimes has been shown to scale exponentially for certain problems. So the quantum tensor networks are a way of dealing with the size of the base, of the bond dimension on the quantum computer. So if you read my work with my colleagues, um, I think that's very recent actually. Um, they use the quantum mirror approach. So that, that's a way of doing, leveraging the exponential scaling of qubits combined with the classical tensor networks, yeah, which is a new method. So much. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm not sure if this is like some basic knowledge, but is there a way of uh, getting the ansatz like a smart kind of method, or if, it, or if it's just, or is it just like a heuristic method, like a trial and error approach? Um, so there have been some papers which show in the limit, the exceptional limit you can get an ansatz which will be the, get the exact ground state. For example, there's a famous paper, the symmetry preserving ansatz, but I think you need exponential parameters for that to be, to be sure. I personally think that the group, the internal group symmetries give a lot of arguments as to why you can reduce the parameters, but 
that, that's not really the answer, but um, the, the, so like, so with the internal symmetries of the wave function often mean that parts of it don't need to talk because they're in different irreducible representations. That's often represented in matrix problems by like block diagonalization, where you have lots of zeros. So I think maybe it's an, an ANZAT using total spin, for example, to take advantage of that. I don't know if you're familiar with the genealogical coupling of spin eigenfunctions, but you can basically couple spin eigenfunctions in like a tree network. I always thought it'd be cool to map a quantum circuit ANZAT to that. But then if you want to just go through the heuristic route, you can do this variational compilation approach which is where you kind of successfully add gates. There's like the, the adapt and that, and there's also, I got to work on this as well, but you basically make the cost function the overlap with some state that you want, and you keep adding, adding gates until you get closer to this cost function, but that's very heuristic. So and making and that is a very difficult problem. It's the same thing in tense networks, in fact, the classical space, like you're just throwing MPSs and mirror it problems which don't necessarily have that inherent structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask first a technical question about the Hadama test, uh, where there was a W operation that uh, I want, just wanted to ask uh, which operation is it? Uh, so that's a phase gate. So that, will give, that, will give you the, that will give you the imaginary part of the excitation wave. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And uh, this guy, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, all right, all right. And uh, and also in the same uh, in the same slide there is uh, that um, uh, the wave function scale linearly with a qubit number. I was uh, wondering if this oh, means okay. an advantage respect to the classical uh, yeah. numerical methods or. Yeah. So this yeah yes yeah, this is probably badly worded but what I'm trying to say is that you, the the basis dimension here is so you can represent an exponential number of states in this part by a linear number of qubits, because you have two to the n possible like one to zero combinations. Whereas you have to score this explicitly as a vector in a classical space. So you've got to store an exponential scaling vector. So you, you get you have a linear object to scale to store rather than a exponential scaling object. But there's a lot of other problems with storing the quantum state. It's not as simple as this one-to-one -one comparison. Okay, and uh, last question about phase estimation. If there was any, like, since with phase estimation we get a bit representation that is a, an approximation of the real eigenvalue, yeah. I was wondering if uh, it was possible to apply any rescaling to the operator that we are applying in order to get integer eigenvalues and so more precise um, re bit representation of the eigenvalue. So you change the time step, sort of, in the phase almost. Wait, no. Hmm. That's a very good idea. I'm not such how it's short easy that would be able to apply to the canonical form, because that algorithm is kind of like a recipe that you can't really touch. But I actually have some slides on some modern approach to phase estimation that I will talk about in the next slide, which kind of do use a similar argument. You use different time step lengths, which can still calculate the phase. Uh, but it's not quite a rescaling, but it's just a different way to get the phase. Um, but yeah, I hope. That's okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Another question? Can we go back to the uh, phase gadget? Yeah. The, the power yeah. gadget? Yeah, okay. My favorite primitive. This guy. Yeah. Uh, so you suggested that people put in a bunch of like cats and analyze what happens. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't the students instead use the powerful and convenient stabilizer formalism to analyze what happens <laughs> with these circuits? I like to think about everything in terms of states because I like wave functions flying around. Masochism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think if anyone's interested around the break, I'll show people how to decompose this circuit 
with the stabilized formalism and show that this, you know, executes some polygadget. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Nathan again. So